We are live. Welcome to LinkedIn Live. A warm welcome to the Healing Healthcare Authors Tour with your hosts, Dina Redinger and Sharon Weinstein, co-authors of the book, Healing Healthcare, Evidence-Based Strategies to Mend Our Broken System. Dina is collaborating with clients today, and I'm here to welcome our special guest. Let's think about it. Nurses remain the backbone of healthcare, and little has been done or even studied to remedy a system that is clearly in crisis. If this is not addressed now, humankind will suffer. This book is packed with solutions to the problems that plague our healthcare systems today. The issues that lead to these troubling sentiments among prospective nurses or existing nurses. Nurse leaders share their experiences, their thoughts, the evidence, and strategies to ensure the health of our healthcare. What you will find within the book are actionable steps for fixing a system that is clearly suffering in silence. We must get this book into the hands of those making the decisions. Before we start today, I want to acknowledge you and thank you for joining us. We have viewers from across the globe, so please use chat and let us know where you're from and if you see this in the replay, you can still comment and we will respond. Today, I am so pleased to welcome Jacqueline Dunbar-Jacob, whose chapter, Education, The Challenges Facing Nursing, as today's guest. You may know her as Dean Emeritus, Distinguished Service Professor of Nursing and author. She was the Dean of the School of Nursing at the University of Pittsburgh from 2001 through 2022. Jacqueline is an advisory professor at the University of Fudan in Shanghai, China, China, honorary professor of nursing at Capital Medical University in Beijing, and visiting professor in nursing at Taipei Medical University in Taipei, Taiwan. She is an accomplished scholar, and she is both a registered nurse as well as a licensed psychologist. Welcome, Jackie. We're so glad to have you on the show today. Thank you. I am delighted to be here, Sharon. Thank you. So let me just start with a question and ask you, why were you involved? Why did you accept the invitation to be a part of this book? So uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say that the book is a very exciting book and I think is exceptionally timely given where our healthcare system is today. And I'm honored to be a part of that book. I was I was very enthusiastic about um, joining the group of authors as Sharon and Dina um, prepared to get this book off the road, um, or on the road, I should say. Uh, I've been in education for a long time, and over that period of time, um, we, we haven't seen a lot of progression in what we do. Um, with our nursing students. And yet there are changes going on in the world that really say that we need to be doing some different things in our educational systems. And so I was happy to be able to have a voice uh, in support of that. Okay, we appreciate that. And you and I are also partners on a writing group for the Academy. And a lot of what we've talked about in the past has been related to fatigue. And we've published on that. So before I ask you the next question, are nurses just too tired to continue? Is that part of it? What have we done? So, so when we, when we look at the fatigue, we can look at fatigue from a couple of different lenses. So one is, are we working nurses too hard? And I think there are many of us who would say that the 12 hour shift uh, is an exhausting experience. Uh, while it's great to have four days off a week or three days off a week, mm -hmm. um, it, it's nevertheless an exhausting experience while one is actually at work uh, for that period of time. So th that's one way that we can look at fatigue, but we can also look at fatigue as psychological phenomenon. And um, we, we have learned that one of the things that happens with nurses is they 
um, particularly nurses who end up leaving the profession early, is that they don't feel prepared as they're starting out as nurses to work um, as at the level at which the hospitals and other agencies expect them to be working. And that's supported by reports from nursing administrators and so on who say that nurses aren't coming out of the education system ready, ready to work. Um, and that's very fatiguing uh, in, a, in a psychological sense. Um, being put into an environment that you're not quite sure you can uh, manage up to expectations and yet having to do that day after day. So we do need to be looking at strategies in our educational system that are going to, um, going to relieve some of the fatigue. And as nurses, as, as you say, Sharon, um, as more senior nurses in the settings, we need to be looking into the why of nurse fatigue and and the, the many components of it and how we can alleviate that fatigue. The exactly. Part of them. Exactly. So in your chapter, you say that the most significant challenge facing nursing today is preparing nurses, preparing students, and practicing nurses for the evolving world of healthcare. Tell us about that. So, so it's interesting in university settings, we say that um, we are preparing students and it doesn't matter what the discipline is. We are preparing students to be lifelong learners. Um, I'm not so sure we're always doing that. Uh, we, ha we have a rapidly evolving healthcare system, health healthcare experiences that are due to some very unique uh, and identifiable factors. So in the first instance, we see a, an escalating, rapidly escalating increase in the older adult population due to wonderful factors. We have improved healthcare so that we have extended longevity. We have improved environmental conditions so that individuals can live longer, uh, even if they may have some chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. So we have more people, an increasing population of people who are needing to utilize the healthcare system. At the same time, and the second factor, is we have a decline in the youth population. So we've seen a decline in fertility rates for the last two decades. And we have fewer and fewer people being born and coming into the, coming, coming into the world. And therefore, fewer and fewer people coming into the workforce. So at the same time, we have an increasing need. We have the, ex, the, we, we have the factor of fewer people to call upon to work within the healthcare field. Uh, and, and we're certainly seeing that. And again, we're seeing that in every discipline. I, you know, we're, we're seeing that in nursing, we're seeing it in physical therapy, we're seeing it in medicine. Um, but not only there, um, I don't know how many of you have tried to get your refrigerator repaired in the last few months. <laughs> and, and you wait because there's a shortage of technicians and, Consequently, you have to get in line. <laughs> um, and there's a supply chain issue, just like there is in healthcare. There are no problems. There's a supply chain issue. So that's that's the second major factor that is affecting us, that we're not suddenly going to produce more people who are 20 years old to go into nursing school. Um, so we, we have to be able to uh, accommodate increase in utilization, decrease in uh, workforce availability. The third thing that is happening um, that affects of all, all of this and affects um, how we educate nurses going forward, how we should be educating nurses going forward, is there is a rapidly escalating uh, 
technology development and utilization of technology within healthcare. So we're seeing um, an expansion of telehealth. Uh, yes, we expected this during COVID uh, when it was not safe to go where there were crowds of people, um, including uh, doctor's offices. But we've seen a continuation of telehealth options since then. We've seen an increase in the utilization of individual monitors to assess patients. So um, monitoring blood pressure, monitoring exercise, and so on at home, uh, and then providing those data for clinicians to utilize. That's and true. Course, you know, even when you do it telehealth visit with your doctor, they say, have you done your pulse ox? Have you taken your blood pressure? Have you done this? Have you done that? So the onus is on the patient or the client to be able to, right. to monitor themselves. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And at the same and at the same time, in the you know, in the whole technology sector, we're seeing uh, an increase in utilization of artificial intelligence just everywhere. And um the artificial intelligence has been wonderful uh, in helping with uh, diagnostic decision making uh, and and certain other areas of decision making in healthcare. But it has its own uh, drawbacks. There there are uh, indications that technology may be biased um, and and other other issues that really require a clinician capable of utilizing the data, not only from, uh, from AI, but from the monitors that, that were, um, where we're collecting data from the home. Um, the clinician has to be able to, uh, to understand, utilize, identify problem areas, and so on the technology. And, my guess would be that the increase in the utilization of technology is going to increase and expand exponentially, particularly to the extent that it allows us to provide quality health care with a smaller health care population uh, ratio to patients requiring care. That's really interesting. I'm so glad that you brought up the concept of AI. In my role as the as the innovation manager for the community, uh, the ANA innovation community, I get a lot of questions about the concept of a title, a new title in nursing called AI nurse. Is there such a thing? If there is, I'm not aware of it. And I would say that, that given the speed with which AI is being integrated into healthcare, that should be every nurse that every nurse should be able to understand and utilize quality yeah. AI exactly. <laughs> um, as a, as a, in the same way that those of us who've been around for a long time uh, understand thermometers and blood pressure cuffs. It's just right. another tool. Um, right, but it should be a complement to care, not a substitute for. Exactly. Yeah, it's never. Right. It's... When I used to teach infusion therapy, I always used to say the pump or the, the monitor is something, it's there to help you to facilitate the process. It's not to take your place. It doesn't mean that you no longer assess the patient, yeah. assess the site, look at what's happening, take a big picture and document appropriately. It's only there to complement what you're already doing That's so well. Right. That's right, it's a tool. Exactly. It's easy to use. Mm -hmm. So Jackie, what is the strongest takeaway from your chapter? What tidbit or two or whatnot? What, what are a couple of thoughts that will lead to transformative change in terms of preparing nurses for the future? Well, let, let me put a fourth uh, strat, a fourth issue that's, hap that's happening. Um, Go for it. And then answer that question. So the, okay. so the fourth thing that is happening is we've had an escalation in the amount of research um, in healthcare, <coughs> excuse me, from all of the disciplines that are contributing to healthcare as well as the basic sciences. Um, and that escalation of research has 
led to this incredible volume of knowledge that's just kind of spilled out. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, in, in, in uh, 2017, um, it, it was stated that within the medical field, and, it, and I'm including nursing and all of the other health sciences in that, um, that the half-life of information was about a year and a half. Wow. Meaning that 50% of what we know changes within a year and a half. Um, and that's critically important. Uh, uh, that's another critically important factor as we, it, when we think about uh, the education of nurses. And the prediction is that that time period will, you know, will further uh, hasten and that it'll be shorter and shorter periods of time with more and more knowledge. So, so anyway, with those four factors in place, increase in the need for utilization of healthcare due to the aging population who are the highest users of healthcare and the decline in the fertility rates leading to smaller availability of workforce and the increase in the utilization of technology and its, its um, demands on the patient for accurate assessment and demands on the clinician for the ability to utilize data um, in, in a clinically helpful way. Um, and the fact that what we know changes so quickly. Um, we need to be educating students in somewhat different ways than we're currently educating. Right. Yes, they need to know the basics of diseases and what the standards of nursing care are, but they need to know how to reason quantitatively because data is even more important and prevalent in, in clinical practice now than it was in the old days when right. we relied a lot on how we, on our impression of how the patient was. Um, it means that we need to teach students to learn and motivate the practicing nurse to stay current because what she learned two years ago, half of that isn't fact any longer. Right. Um, so I, so I think those are two things we need, we need to, um, teach the nurses how to appropriately utilize technology as, as a, another tool in their uh, box or their bag <laughs> um, in the care of patients and to use it wisely. Right, it's another tool in the toolkit. There's no yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. So I, so I think if there is, um, you know, one takeaway, it's that we need to be educating nurses for the present not yesterday, and we need to be anticipating the future. Okay, so educate for the present and anticipate the, to the for the future. Interesting. Not go back to what happened years ago because the only thing that hasn't changed is basically, except for the technology, you take a blood pressure the same way. Mm -hmm. And if you've had the same experiences that I have sometimes in an office, the equipment doesn't work, and the physician or the practitioner will pull out a sphygmo and a blood pressure cuff and take it manually and get a better read. Yeah, yeah. And and how many times have we been in practitioner's office or in the hospital setting and the standards for how you take a blood pressure in order to get an accurate blood pressure are not followed? No, they're not. They're not. It, it's It's rather sad. And the same thing happens with phlebotomy and with everything else, every aspect of it. Some things, you're right. We need to teach for the present and plan for the future so that we are preparing a cadre of nurses who will be able to care for you and I. That's and right. Here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Well, gosh, thank you so much, Jackie. We are so deeply honored to have you as a part of this book. You bring such wisdom to the table. And, and your chapter within the, the uh, wisdom section of the book is just so powerful that I cannot wait to get it into the hands of readers. 
it will be released for pre-order in June and then for actual sale in September. So I hope that our viewers will watch for announcements from that. And we do have now a special LinkedIn page for it. And we'll be having a Facebook page as well. We have a landing page and we're just thrilled to pieces with the response, with the content of what has been submitted is just so strong and so powerful. And again, we're just thrilled to have you here. But it is time for a close. This is a short call and an intro. We want to give you an invitation to join us again next week as we welcome another one of your peers to the program. We're thrilled to have you with us. Please join me in thanking Jacqueline Dunbar Jacob for joining us today. Thank you, Jackie. It's my honor. <laughs> and we'll look forward to reposting this on LinkedIn. Thank you.